Hello and welcome to another episode of Pakistanomy. My name is Uzair Yunus and today I have the honor of hosting my colleague, friend, Professor Dr. Irfan Nuruddin. He is the Senior Director at the South Asia Center at the Atlantic Council, which is where I work as well, running the Pakistan Initiative. Um, he's a professor at Georgetown University and somebody who's done some fantastic research on political economy, uh, both in South Asia and in around the world. And recently a book came out, The Everyday Crusade, which he's the author of. Uh, he's written Elections in Hard Times and also Coalition Politics and Economic Development, which is right here in front of me, which is the book we're going to be talking about today with uh, Irfan, uh, mainly because I found it interesting. Irfan was talking to Pakistan's finance minister, Dr. Mifta Ismail, when he was here about coalition politics and how um, it can actually be good in terms of economic growth and development. Uh, which is really counterintuitive. Um, and there's a mainstream belief in a country like Pakistan that a centralized government, a government where the prime minister is strong or even maybe a presidential system uh, can allow the government to bypass, quote unquote, the mafias um, that stand in the way of reform. And Dr. Nuruddin's research finds out that um, it's actually better to have coalition and weaker governments and parliamentary democracies if your goal really is to push reforms and have sustainable uh, economic growth, not with a boom bust cycle that Pakistan is used to. So I figured that I invite uh, Irfan to this podcast to tell us about his research. Uh, Irfan, welcome to Pakistanomy. Thank you for taking out the time today. And, and let's just jump right in. Um, your research, the book was fascinating. I just finished it yesterday. Um, basically argues that, you know, if you as a democratic country, as a parliamentary democracy, um, are looking at reforms and growth, coalition and weak politics or weak governments actually are the way to go. Why is that? The main argument there is that once you have to compromise and negotiate over economic reform, the reforms might be smaller, they might be slower, but they're stickier. And so a large part of the intuition behind the book, which as you point out is counterintuitive, is to take the perspective not of the policymaker, not of an average citizen, but really the uh, the perspective of investors. And by investors, I mean domestic investors, foreign investors, anyone with capital who has to make a decision whether or not to invest that capital in something that invariably will be a long-term benefit horizon, right? So we're not talking about trading on a day-to-day -day basis. We're saying, should I build a factory here today? knowing that the benefits of that factory are going to come in a couple of years, five years, 10 years, et cetera. So from that perspective, longer term horizons are the key insight of the book. And I think of a lot of political economy research now that builds on the book that says that what investors really want is certainty. They want to know, not can you promise me something really glamorous right now? That's nice, <laughs> right? All investors and anyone wants to hear a politician say, listen, I'll take care of you. But what they really want to know is, are you capable of getting things through and leaving them in place so that in five years, when you may no longer be in power, this will still be the rules of the game? In 10 years, in 15 years, even in 20 years, can I have some predictability of what the policy is? And so the the you know the common wisdom might be that in these developing countries, what we want is a strong leader who's got a clear vision and can push through an agenda. And there is some truth to that, right? I mean, if you really are in a complete mess, what you might want to need to get unstuck, what you might want to go to go from point zero to point one is somebody who's got the ability to put through a lot of policies that if they had to compromise, if they had to negotiate, might be very hard. But what when we what happens when we think about period two, not just period zero to one, but period one to two? What happens if that strong man, powerful leader, is no longer as powerful or no longer in charge. Does the next government keep those same rules or do we run the risk of them saying, nope, we don't want to do that any longer. We're going to do something different. And from that perspective, one other layer just to put on the burner for your audience is to think not just about the leaders who make the rules, but the institutional structures within which those rules get made. So we're talking about democratic systems. So what it means to have a strong leader is to have democratic institutions that concentrate and centralize power. The canonical example here being a presidential system. But the trick with the presidential system is that the next president also has those powers, right? So in 
you know, think about the United States. All the Democrats who were very happy when President Obama was president and could make a bunch of executive orders that were in line were far less happy when it was suddenly Donald Trump with the same powers in his hands. And as Republicans who were happy when it was Donald Trump, less happy when it's Joe Biden now with the power of the presidential pen. So the way in which you want to get policy made that's investor friendly is to make reform, obviously, but to have those reforms reflect a core of the political system such that they cannot be changed party to party. So, you know, the book applies, as you know, uh, the main framework to India. I grew up in India. I was thinking about the Indian political economy. And as a political science graduate student, was steeped in this literature on political institutions that made that conventional argument that strong parties, strong leaders should be better for economic growth. We were still very influenced by the East Asian miracle in the 1990s of these newly industrializing countries in East Asia that seemed to combine strong governance, dictatorships even, and economic growth. And at the same time in India, we had massive economic reforms in 1991, probably the best decade of growth in independent India's history, all under minority and coalition governments uh, in charge. In fact, between 1991 and 2014, only coalition governments ruled India, and India continued to grow. Maybe not as fast as some of us would have liked or wanted or hoped for, but it grew. And the reforms passed stuck. They became the new status quo. So even when Modi comes to power, with an absolute majority, still part of a broader coalition, but his own party had a majority, he doesn't turn those policies over. He starts moving the ball further forward, right? Because the core policies that had been negotiated by those big coalitions in the 90s were sticky. And the argument effectively is that that's really good for investors who might want more, but will settle for less as long as it's predictable and as long as it will stay. So in a nutshell, for all of the people and Indian newspapers and op-eds are full of pundits saying, what India needs is a presidential system. We need a strong leader. A lot of the you know, fan fair around Modi is that he's a presidential style leader and all of that. Uh, my book would suggest that you might want that, but there's no evidence uh, around the world that this is actually good for economic growth, that it's good for investment, that it's good for savings, et cetera. I think one of the key things that sort of on the India chapter in your book that stood out to me was that India is also like a federation of many different economies, right? And then you also look at the fact that your argument here holds true for Indian state uh, governments and states as well, where in fact states like Kerala or West Bengal, communist in nature at that time, but also part of a lot larger coalition actually had higher growth um, and less volatility versus the more centralized ones having lower growth and higher volatility. And in fact, the book, the chapter shows that, you know, you had that volatility, even if you account for the broader Indian economy, that still that relationship still holds true at the state level. And I found that fascinating, uh, primarily in the sense that you look at the, these, these different factors in East Asia, as you mentioned, right? In East Asia, I always tell people, well, the East Asian medical economies were Indonesia, South Korea, Taiwan, and Malaysia, if you want to include that, and a couple of others, East Asia is much bigger than that. Um, and in fact, even a country like Indonesia is not as centralized as an outsider may perceive it to be. Um, so I think we fall for that for that mistake over there. But one thing that that stood out to me is is this culture of political institutions and strong men uh, not being in charge across the board, right? And to a Pakistani audience, what stood out as a Pakistani, what stood out to me was that you know you could have a similar strong man um, in the judiciary where Pakistan is no stranger to the famous uh, Rico Dick case, which just got settled out of court with a 10 plus billion dollar claim on the exit, um, mainly because the Supreme Court Chief Justice said this, this agreement is nonsensical, I'm throwing it out, and the whole country suffered as a result of that. So help us understand why is that this distribution of power, this decentralization, so to speak, of power um, is important for investors, because in the book, you make a very interesting point that stability is what investors need. And if the more power is distributed, the harder it is to destabilize the system. Why is that something investors look for? So the insight from business school literatures and the economics literature is that investors 
can price in and hedge against suboptimal policy environments, right? So there's lots of policies that investors would want something better, uh, right? They could design a better policy that would be more investor friendly. But as long as they know what the policy is going to be today, and as long as they know with some predictability that that same policy will be in place two years from now, what we know from a lot of the economics and B-school literature is that they can price that in, right? They can pass it along. They can think about changing supply chains. Uh, they can think about input costs. They could think about sort of how to, which costs can be passed to consumers, which have to be absorbed. And they can hedge when necessary because they can think about other investments that sort of balance out the portfolio in terms of putting in there. But all of that is predicated on, I know what the state of the world is I'm in, and I have some expectation of what the state of the world tomorrow will be and six months from now will be. So the question is, how as a government can you make a credible commitment to your investors that you are going to actually stick to your guns? Every government has an incentive to promise investors not only that they'll do the right thing, but that they won't change their mind. They were going to stick to it. They're going to, you know, they won't take it back. And every investor will say, well, that works for you right now. But the moment I've dug that hole in the ground to build a factory, I've sunk my costs. When the language of economics, I've made an irreversible investment. Then you can change the game and I'm stuck. <laughs> my money's in the ground. What do I do then? So the hard question- And sorry to interrupt, interrupt yeah. you here, but an exa a case in point is actually what's going on in Pakistan right now. Six months ago, the IMF program was on track. The government was promising to stay on it. And on its way out, they violated the agreement. And now the new government is trying to get the IMF back on track. And if you were an investor six months ago, digging that hole for a factory, you're basically screwed at this point. That's right. You got, so, you know, this long-term kind of investment that we know is economic growth friendly uh, is a lot of sunk costs, a lot of upfront costs, a lot of irreversible investment. It's, you want to, you're making a bet on the future and you want stability over there. And you'd prefer stability in a less good equilibrium then the promise of a good equilibrium that is then, you know, you get the rug pulled out from under you. So if you think about it that way, then the challenge for governments is to make a credible commitment, but they can't because we all know that they have an incentive just to change their minds later if the circumstances uh, are different. And so the argument in the book and the evidence in the book is that when that decision is no longer in their hands, when it is in fact taken out of the hands so that independent judiciaries, independent central banks, Etc. are created, then what you have is a distribution, a diffusion of policymaking authority across multiple actors that, again, need not, and this is a really key point, need not end up in a good policy space. But what they do is prevent radical changes, arbitrary changes of the policy environment overnight. Though I will say, as I, you know, when I went into the project, which started as my PhD dissertation, then over a period of almost seven years sort of was adapted into the book that you've so generously read and are showcasing for your audience. I started thinking that independent central banks, for instance, that independent judiciaries, which are well understood to be good for economic growth in the developed world, would have a similar effect in the developing world. And the empirics actually are much more muted on that front, right? Uh, because what we know, both in India and I suspect in Pakistan, is that politicians interfere in the day-to-day -day running of courts all over the place, uh, that courts are not nearly as independent of politics as we might think that they should be. Even something as, you know, sort of sacred as a central bank has lots of political interference at various points in time, uh, right? And lots of reasonable people disagree as to how independent the bank should be. But the point is, I, I did not find that those institutions were as good for growth and dampening volatility as theory had expected. But what I did find consistently, right, at the national level, at the state level, at the cross-national level, was that the diffusion of power across different political parties who represent different societal interests, that was critical. So the other insight that I gained, and again, I attribute this to the data work as opposed to sort of a theoretical idea I had a priori, was that I was going into this thinking, how do you dampen volatility? 
right? Which is itself pretty good. I mean, Pakistan's experiencing a massive inflationary crisis right now that makes the crisis in the United States look like child's play by comparison. Latin America had hyperinflation for so many years. So growth volatility in and of itself is problematic. Even if you've got a reasonable growth rate, massive fluctuations of growth are not good. I was willing to accept that maybe this the set of institutions was good for growth volatility, even at the price of pure absolute economic growth, but in fact found that that was not a choice that had to be made, that over the long run, uh, these institutions both reduce growth volatility, but they also increase domestic savings. They increase foreign investment, they reduce capital flight, they increase economic growth. And I was even able to show this in a limited sample of only the African Sub-Saharan African countries, even there, which again, this is, book is now 10 years old. The data was looking at 1960 to 20, 2005 to, to, to 2010. Even in that sample of some of the most challenged economies in the world, the least integrated in the global system, wherever you could get some diffusion of power away from presidential style democracy to more parliamentary style democracy, away from a pure majority government to a more coalition government, you both had lower volatility, but also higher growth. So the mechanisms, I think we need a lot of research to think through when and how this works most or best, but the core finding I'm willing to bet on, uh, coalitions work. Now, one of the questions, and I would love for your perspective on this is that, you know, the question is what kind of coalition? And, you know, we are so used to coalitions being these post-election, you know, strange bedfellows, marriages of convenience. You know, I go, I buy 10 votes from this party and I go get 15 over here. That's not the only kind of coalition that one could imagine. There are other coalitions that are different political parties representing different segments of society, maybe different geographies in the country, but that share something of a common ideology. They share certain values that are more steadfast, right? so that the coalition itself has some longevity. And the argument in the book, I think, and the data suggests that those are the kind of coalitions that work best, right? If it's simply, uh, we'll get anybody who's willing to come into the party and so that they can get a ministry, you get a ministry, uh, that coalition is not as effective because again, it's got zero longevity. Tomorrow there'll be another patron and <laughs> these guys will all switch sides Again, so what we really, what I really would love for your audience to think about when they hear the word coalition politics is how do we get as many different voices who represent different parts of the political sphere, of the social sphere, into the policymaking room? Because that's how you get the economic reform that's likely to be sticky. Yeah, I think that was one of the notes that I took down thinking about your findings from a Pakistani perspective was that if the entire system itself is exclusionary, where different political parties at the ethnic level or maybe at some level may be different, but from a class-based perspective, in essence, um, are of the 1%, you know, it's a kleptocracy, I keep saying this in my, in my podcast after talking to so many guests, then why would the status quo ever push the types of reforms you and I are talking about and would be interested in because they're the beneficiaries of that lack of reform or they're the beneficiaries of the status quo, right? And that's a challenge in the Pakistani context is how do you get there? Um, and in the book, even at the end, you argue that more democracy is always better. It's a journey, right? It doesn't happen overnight. And perhaps that's where we need to go. But coming back to something else that, that I found interesting was this idea that, you know, volatility is an important component of this whole story. Because what you argue, and I agree with, and we've had guests like Amar Khan who have argued this point. In fact, I sent them a screenshot of a passage from your book, and I said, Amar, it seems like you wrote this paragraph, right? Even though he didn't. Um, but he puts it in the argument that, you know, sovereign risk goes up, and there's a risk premium. And when there's a risk premium, um, and there's high inflation, the expected rate of return for a project goes up to 25, 30, 35%. And you argue the same thing that in that environment, projects that otherwise would be feasible are not going to be implemented. And that's the last thing a country needs. And again, the suboptimal outcome that we're looking for or investors are looking for, they may settle for that provided the IRR is 12, 15, 18%, not 30 plus percent in that case. And I think that was 
a very interesting That's finding. a critical point is there, and I'm glad it resonated with you because I think one of the truths is that we are talking about a set of countries and definitely with India and Pakistan, um, and more so Pakistan than India at this point in their relative histories, where we are capital scarce domestically. Right. And so a large part of the trick is that we're convinced we have to convince foreign investors to come in. But those investors have a lot of suitors. Right. Every one of these companies, every one of these funds could think about a number of different places in which they can take that capital. And so they want the highest return, but they also are trying to think of the risk adjusted return over here. And it might be great that the country is growing at seven, eight, 10 percent. But if there's an election in the offing, and the great thing about democracies is there's always another election on the horizon. Or in the Pakistani context, there's a new selection in the offing. Bingo. If there's a new selection in the offing and you worry that the next guy selected can just change everything overnight, then you might still be willing to make that investment, but you're making it on a very different time horizon. You're not building the long-term factory. You might take a share in a particular company for a little bit, because you know you, you want the ability to pull it out uh, overnight, right? So portfolio investment versus foreign direct investment, uh, for instance. Right now in the United States, for instance, right, you've got a whole bunch of companies that have gotten very used to easy credit, were growing rapidly, and now all of a sudden, you know, quantitative tightening, interest rate hiking uh, system are changing. You know, they're going to cut down on hiring, they're going to cut down on investment, they're going to tighten their uh, balance books uh, because they're looking at an environment where they're very, very different. But a large part of this is the Fed signaling very credibly, here's the world you're about to enter, make your adjustments. It's a well-functioning system. And even there, we see companies making the kinds of decisions that are really forward-looking and are saying, how do I change my behavior in ways that are going to be good for that? Every company is doing that. But when they look at a country like uh, Pakistan, what they're seeing is uncertainty risks <laughs> where the premium is such a why would i bother right this is not worth even getting into because i can't possibly make a return quickly enough to make that risk or the long-term uh, benefit is and so i think we want to really think about that sort of the deferred is too kind but essentially the counterfactual of what kinds of investments what kind of economies could we grow if we could figure out how to be rational in our policy making and provide some stability, because what's happening is that those are scarce resources that are going elsewhere. And I think we often ignore that in these conversations about uh, investment. So you and I have been part of so many conversations where, you know, politicians or bureaucrats from the uh, from our countries come to the United States and pitch to investors. And what they all pitch is what they're going to do differently than the last guys, right? And on the one hand, I, I get why that is. But so much of what I think is right in this book is you also have to tell them what you're going to continue, why they should think that there's going to be some stability. But if the playbook is the last guys were a bunch of crooks and we're going to change everything, guess what? They fully expect that the next guys are going to say the same thing about you. And then you get stuck in a bad equilibrium, I would argue. My other favorite piece of this book is, I don't know whether you got to that chapter of the comparative cases, but Italy it's just one of those really striking examples, right? I mean, in the 50 years after World War uh, II, Italy had 50 different governments. I mean, that is a level of political instability that even Pakistan and India can't imagine. Right? 50 different governments in 50 years. And yet, an economy that just keeps on, kept on chugging, again, not at the heights maybe of a Germany or whatever, but low volatility, relatively uh, strong economy. And part of the argument over there is that all of those coalitions that were forming were forming around a central core, right? They had a center that was occupied. And so maybe this final thing, and I'd love to get your thinking on this, is that we live in this period of hyperpolarization uh, in a lot of spaces. And it's, I think, the challenge when I think about where the, how the book has aged, you know, 11 years after it was initially published, is whether or not there's still a core around which politics revolves so that you can get different actors in there, but you know what the core is. In India, that used to be the Congress party, uh, right, uh, in a sense. One could argue the BJP is now the new core, right, and has become, in that sense, a centrist party, center-right party, but a centrist party economically and can have some different actors. 
But if your only political parties are purely on the left or purely on the right, so that the core is empty, then you get pretty significant instability in a way that uh, coalitions might form, but they're of the marriages of convenience variety, and that's not necessarily good. So someone's got to occupy the center for much of, of the logic to work, I think. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, I would also add to this um, is that, you know, the core also has to be one where it's guided by this idea of inclusive growth, not extractive growth. Um, yes. And again, that's a challenge in the Pakistani context, again, which I keep arguing. And, and you know, the Indian example better than I, but I always tell Pakistanis is just pull up the list of the Lok Sabha in India and compare the types of people in the Indian Lok Sabha yes. with the types of people in the National Assembly of Pakistan. And there in and of itself, you will see why a coalition even may not work in the Pakistani context, because it does not represent broad swaths of society the way the Indian Lok Sabha does. And it's even more uh, you know, evident at the provincial level, so to speak. Uh, and that's something I'm thinking about after after reading this book is how do you get to that point, right? Is and the provincial question? level in Pakistan is very different than the state level in India. You know, and the states are the unsung heroes, I think, of India's economic growth because India's economic growth is not one story. The south of India, uh, you know, Maharashtra, where I grew up in the city of Bombay, but and south uh, is an economic engine that fuels the rest of the country. I mean, the per capita... Uh, GDP of the south of India is three times that of North India. Right, the financial flows are disproportionately into the south. Delhi is an enclave that is different, but we do have really significant geographical disparities emerging uh, in India. But because the states are such powerful actors in the Indian constitution, they were both able to make policy innovation at the state level, uh, and it was wonderful from the book's perspective to see that verified even in a state like Kerala with an ostensibly communist socialist bent, but very coalition, very stable coalitions uh, over there versus North India, where you have more single party regimes, but where there's a lot of oscillation. The BJP wins an election, the Congress wins an election, and lots changes. So I think one of the things it's useful for everyday citizens to think about because this again this logic of a strong leader who can cut through all the rubbish can get rid of all the vested interests is very attractive and i think we want to distinguish between let's say everyday public services right i mean it is i don't think you need a coalition to get the garbage cleaned more regularly or the streets potholes fixed more regularly or etc right or even to get the police to do its job as opposed to being a bastion of corruption. My guess is maybe in a lot of those settings, having a strong leader with a commitment to those ideas can get stuff done. But that's different than the macro economy. And the macro economy is more complicated in a certain sense. It requires we have different actors and we require that changes to the policy framework are seen as legitimate, because if not, they can be reversed. And if they can be reversed, uh, nothing good happens. So I've found myself thinking a lot about the Modi government's record on economic reform. You know, this was a big promise of Prime Minister Modi. In many ways, he's delivered on a large part of that agenda. But he's got an absolute majority in parliament. He passed with that absolute majority three major farm bills. All three of them had to be retracted because of the opposition that came from the from the people. Right? From and I don't want to argue whether or not they were good reforms or not reforms. I think in terms of illustrating the logic of the book, because he did not have to go out and build a coalition and build consensus around those reforms, he didn't. He got them through. But the price of that was a protest that forced him to have to pull that back. Think of the data localization framework and a lot of those policies that, again, Modi has announced hasn't actually gotten to the implementation stage because the lack of consultation, the lack of sort of coalition building the lack of compromise made those much more divisive than they could have been. And when Manmohan Singh was in office, he didn't have that option. There was no way he could pass anything unless he went and talked to every single member of the coalition and said, if I do this, okay, not okay, what price to pay? Uh, and so, you know, this is just one of those cases where I think the difference between the macro economy and let's call it public service delivery at a local uh, level level 
uh, is quite different. And if you focus on the macroeconomy, I would argue that the book suggests that coalitions uh, are critical, might be the only path forward for developing countries. But if you really focus on that everyday kind of quotidian politics um, and service delivery, yeah, strong mayors are probably a useful thing. Yeah, and I think again that that's the structure of governance, right? That 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 strongman leadership is, as you said, at the mayoral level is is probably the right way because you need sure. to build the roads and fix the potholes. That's not the job of a parliamentarian or a provincial assembly and an MPA, right, so to speak. Um, and to your point on the Modi thing, I think that's a very interesting point in terms of how well this book has aged because within the Modi government, you see the farm bill on the one hand and the rollout of the GST on the other where by default, Arun Jaitley had to form a coalition on GST because it included exactly. the states, right? And so that momentum continued. And even though GST, I remember when it was rolled out, I was working in, in DC, the rates were crazy. It was mind numbing work to just go through the Excel list and figure out yes. why is deodorant tax at 18% or whatever and something else at 2% or whatever. But it was a coalition rollout which means that it has continued to exist and continue to have support, even though there are kinks in, in the system itself, right? Um, and Pakistan, on the other hand, has been unable to reform its GST despite the IMF repeatedly saying in program after program that you need to fix this tax system. Um, but even Musharraf couldn't do it, and he's a dictator, right? Yeah. And so perhaps that that's again an evidence of the fact that centralized authority may not deliver what we expect it to do. Yeah. Um, one thing that I wanted to get your view on, I think on the volatility point that stood to me in the book was volatility is also bad because not only are domestic savings not going up, but the growth that occurs in a volatile situation is captured by a few and then they can take their wealth outside and guard it. How much of an issue is that around the world as you were doing your research in terms of saying, you know what, that volatility itself and the leakages that occur actually exacerbate the problems that birth the volatility in the first place. It's huge. Uh, capital flight out of the developing world far exceeds all the capital that we are running around trying to get in. We all, everyone who's got their money, right? And capital flight is, there's capital flight that's illegal, right? I mean, that's uh, out and out kleptocracy in the old dictator who had the mansion on the French Riviera kind of stuff. But there's also capital flight in that if I, as an Indian investor, right, or an Indian citizen, have the option of having my son, who's in New Jersey, have it in the dollar-denominated account, right, and I exercise that or I find ways in which to move the money abroad, or, in fact, I pull it out of the economy entirely, right? I put it in gold, I put it in flats, I put it in things that are not productive assets, what we're doing is we're leaching that money out of the productive economy. Whereas the counterfact would be if we had well-capitalized, well-functioning public markets, right? Then the beneficiary of that become the businesses who are who can grow, who can scale, et cetera. But those businesses can only grow and scale if we have policy frameworks that are quite transparent about where we are going to be, what this world is going to look like, what can I expect to happen? So capital flight and gen more generally the movement and protection of monies by the capital class uh, is quite significant. It's our way of hedging against that uncertainty, but most citizens have no way of doing that, <laughs> right? So it becomes this very unequal world. It's always unequal, but it's extremely unequal in this regard. And it's one of the reasons that that parliamentarian club, right, and the investors class around them don't feel the pinch of volatility in the same way because they basically have already got the fixed assets. They already have the flats. They already have the property. They have the land, right? Or they've got the foreign bank accounts in a way that your everyday citizen has none of those things. And so for them, when there's a growth crash or there's an inflationary crisis, it pinches, it hurts, it bites. Uh, but for the money classes, uh, both because they have the protection of money, but also because their investment mix is so different than everyone else's. They don't they don't really think about the problems in the same way. So just to go back to a point you've made a couple of times today, and I've heard you make it over the uh, you know year of the of your podcast. I think one thing I do not do in the book, right? It's a hole in the book, but and you're pushing me on this, is that the period of coalition politics in India coincides also 
with a massive change in the in the profile of parliamentarians, right? I mean, so in 1989 and 1990, you have India gets its first Dalit uh, sort of upsurge, right? Where because as a result of the Mandal Commission report, and a, in the 1990s, you get a sea change uh, through reservations and other things in the political sphere of the average profile of your average parliamentarian in the Lok Sabha, uh, so that you have, and my colleague Yogendra Yadav in India has written very eloquently about this, but you have not just that you get parliament, you get minority politics and coalition politics because of party fragmentation, but that a lot of those parties are now representing classes of the Indian society that were completely excluded from politics before, right? You get parties that are out and out there to represent the Dalit class, the lower caste communities. But because of the fragmentation, the big parties, in this case, the Congress in the 1990s and the BJP in the late 90s, were forced to work with them. And so you both get that fragmentation, that diffusion of power that I argue in the book. But as you've been pointing out, you also get a very different set of actors in the room than once existed. And I suspect those worked together in a way that I don't fully do credit to in the book, but in a revision. Yeah, and, and, and it's one of those things that I'm increasingly thinking about because again, in the Pakistani context, given democracy has been an experiment in fits and starts, and it hasn't sort of, you know, deepened itself in, in, in the country the way the Indian democracy has. And even though India's democracy has its own challenges today, as you talked about the farm bills, right? A, a, a party with a majority had to roll back something. That's a, again, a testament to the democratic ethos and the power of institutions and civil society, et cetera, to force somebody like Modi to take a step back. That's um, right. Again, shows that democracy runs deep. Um, that's not the case in Pakistan, and it's not inclusive. It's, it's not devolved to the local level as yet, um, even though every major party sort of you know pays lip service to that uh, ambition. And so the question to me is, how do you get to that you know, inclusion? And secondly, as happened in the Indian context also, is that you sort of see the sea change in, in Indian politics about a consensus on liberalization. Um, where, you know, whereas in Pakistan, the current government of Shabashri used to complain about petrol bombs up until April, and now they're in power and they're increasing the price of petrol. And the PTI government, when it was in power, used to say, we can't do anything about this, a commodity. They're talking about petrol bombs, right? And That's that, right. again, is a symptom of the crisis that at some level, you need to have the big part, the big boys in the room, so to speak, and they're mostly all men agree that there are certain things where we will agree on and that core in the center, what is it being driven by is a missing yeah. thing. But I mean, look, I mean, not to be rude or reductive about it, but there's a third actor in the Pakistani context that has a significant role both in the economy, but in everyday life, and that's the military. And, you know, one challenge, I think, for Pakistan is that if the military represents the core in the way that we've been talking about it, then the politics becomes peripheral <laughs> to, to that. And that's a really dangerous situation because it means that the politicians are playing for survival and to sort of separate the, they're fighting over the spoils of being in power without having to, without ever feeling like they're really in, responsible for the core status, you know, wealth being of the country because that's the military is over there looking over their shoulder kind of thing. So there's many differences between these countries, but at least the one thing I think India got right, if I may be allowed to say so, at its founding, was establishing that civilian military relationship in a way that privileged the civilian government overwhelmingly. The military has played its role uh, the way I think a constitutional democracy should. It made politics then the center. And with that catch all party, and of course, the Cong the Pakistan also had it. Post-independent uh, parties were the catch-all parties that started. Then you would have had a natural fragmentation as politics became a co complex and as we go further away from the founding fathers of the independent country. But there's been an interruption of that periodically by the military intervention, by the military refusing to cede to politicians the full control of the political economy. Uh, and that, I think, is a challenge that you're better equipped to think about how where solutions might lie than I would. But uh, one of the other examples in the 
book is Brazil, which has its own troubled history with military dictatorship. But Brazilians post-military dictatorship world put the military in its place. <laughs> they write, I mean, the, the civilian politics is still kind of crazy, right? Uh, but till Bolsonaro, you really did not have a leader who could rule with an iron fist across the board. And so you got that coalition dynamic, as I show uh, in the book, um, that's being eroded now that they have a majoritarian leader who's got a lot more power. Uh, but I think for Pakistan, and recognizing that this is a sensitive topic, I think that the outsized role of the military, not just in society, but in that economy, in the preservation of a particular status quo, is as big a challenge as any polarization of the political parties is. No, you're on point on that. And actually, that's where I was going to draw my last question out on that point was that, you know, Imran Khan just yesterday said, you know, he didn't have a lot of control over running the government because power lay elsewhere. He didn't say it, but we know what he meant. And you and I have been in rooms with people from his government who used to say we're all on the same page. Everything's hunky dory. And it's just like the past where every prime minister, when he's in office, says we're all on the same page. Everything's hunky dory. And when they're booted out, um, so to speak, no pun intended on the use of the word booted out, um, they realize that power lay elsewhere. Um, and that, again, is a problem just, and I'll give you know, to the audience an example to sort of like situate what we mean here, is that one of the things I've increasingly started talking about and others in, in Econ Twitter have started talking about is property taxes. And just a fun fact, Arfan, I don't know if you know this, but the city of Pune raises more in property taxes every year than the entire province of Sindh, right? Oh and again, talk about wealth being parked somewhere where nobody can get to it, right? This is evidence of policy, the kleptocracy. That is I mean, amazing. Right? But I tell my friends that you cannot have a solution to this problem, even when politicians say so, because a big player in the real estate market is the military establishment. And if you start taxing them, they're property rich, cash poor. Exactly. That, that, that will have an impact, meaning tomorrow your government may not last and the property tax is sure as hell is not going to last. Right. right. And again, that's a question that how do we break that cycle um, is, is a topic of further research. I think people should talk more about this. But the book is excellent in that it shows that fragmented politics, perhaps especially in diverse societies like India, Pakistan, Brazil is very diverse. Italy has its own diversity. Between exactly. The and the North may be the right path forward. Um, but in the Pakistani context, how do we get to that where politics is dominant, not something else, remains a question. Um, and perhaps somebody somewhere along the road will do more research into that topic. How do we get there? But Irfan, this has been a fascinating conversation. Before I let you go, I ask all my guests, name two or three books that you think people should read can be on any topic. Um, so I would love your recommendations. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. So I'm going to be... Uh... I'll stay on topic. I mean, but, you know, for those of your audience who have never had the chance to read uh, Samuel Huntington's classic 1968 book, it's called Political Order in Changing Societies. Uh, it was probably the foundational text for me when I first encountered it in graduate school. I now make all my students at Georgetown read it. Uh, but it's an absolutely brilliant analysis of the role of political parties in the developing world. And in fact, really the, the seeds of an argument that political stability in the developing world comes not from having strong institutions, but from having parties that can channel everyday citizens all the way to the top. So that's my main uh, one. Um, I'm a big fan of the work of Adam Javorsky, a professor at NYU, who's done some of the best work on economic development, his book, Democracy and Development from 2000, is a classic and would be a great uh, read for anyone. And then finally, just to be slightly different, uh, just finished reading uh, Richard Rhodes's uh, biography of the scientist E.O. Wilson, uh, the Nobel laureate, uh, who uh, right biologist, uh, one of the most important biologists, and just really great to see what a life in science is. Also sort of this clarion call that for all the stuff you and I talk about, climate change is a real existential crisis. And we can't solve that without a big coalition as well. So thank you. Yeah, and, and it will go, you know, that will, climate change will change political order and societies as a whole. And we don't exactly. know what's coming down the pike in terms of the new political order around the world, especially mm -hmm. in the developed world. Even. Um, Irfan, this has been a fantastic conversation. Again, 
Uh, for those of you tuning in, do check out the book. The link is below. Um, highly, highly recommended. And again, thank you for your time. Thank you.